citizens or Americans of all ethnic groups to see what police misconduct looked like. Because before you had not had a video and you had not seen that the police could be terribly outrageous in terms of their brutality. Well, I knew that by the time 1994 rolled around. I'd had many cases uh, where I had represented people who had been drastically beaten uh, by the police, but none were on video cameras. And so uh, it was an opportunity for people to see it. Uh, fast forward, as you all know, the Oscar Grant case, which I was involved in, was a classic example of having a video. Without that video, that case probably would have been a different, it had been reported differently. We would not have had uh, the major uh, sort of community outburst, and it probably wouldn't have been a criminal prosecution, but for the video. But even in that case offered a wonderful opportunity to bring about change, uh, and change in the sense that there was an issue about whether or not the officer uh, got, had what they call weapons confusion, which was a defense that he claimed, that is that he claimed that he had made a mistake. Uh, and pulled the wrong weapon out. Although we did not agree with that, but as a consequence of that case, every police department in the country then had to go through more training uh, to ensure that those that this weapon confusion would not occur. They changed the coloring on the on the on the um, uh, on the taser. They moved it to the, you had to move it to another side of your body, and you had to practice it so not to not for that to happen in, in the future. Uh, and so that case was certainly a, an opportunity to uh, make those kind of ch uh, changes. I represented in the criminal case a six-year-old boy a number of years ago, maybe 1996 or so, who at that time was accused of attempted murder of a, of a baby. And the part that was most disturbing is they were trying to prosecute this kid and put him and make him a ward of the court in a criminal sense. I thought that there was insufficient evidence to justify that. It was a six-year-old boy at the time. And if all of you have had children, you know what a six-year-old is like. You know, I had an eight-year-old at the time, and I knew what he was like. And so I was determined that that young boy was not going to be prosecuted. The moral of that Ultimately, we prevailed on it. He was not prosecuted. He, he was ultimately put in social services. But what we were able to do is make the courts evaluate the standards by which one could evaluate whether a person can be criminally responsible. Now, it turns out, obviously, six was too young. Uh, but they moved it up to more like we came down to, uh, to, to 12. Clearly, you were. But you know possibilities of 11 or 10. But that was a factual. No, that's a factual uh, determination that has to be, to be made about it. And so I, I really worked um, uh, on that case hard. Back in the 1990s, uh, I was involved uh, in two, uh, uh, 1980s, I should, late 1980s, two cases involving uh, black Santa Claus cases. These were two, in two different departments, two different agencies where young men, African American men, uh, big guys, uh, young, who wanted to be Santa Claus. And, uh, and, and they were denied this opportunity. So I sued each of these various agencies. And ultimately, we prevailed. And uh, the young man became um, uh, a Santa Claus, uh, which was good for them. But uh, more importantly, other, there, there became other black Santa Clauses uh, around the time. But, but in terms of what I have been most uh, involved in more recently, uh, and, and where the civil rights uh, effort has been made predominantly is involving cases involving uh, the city of Oakland. And one of which, the most uh, prominent one, is called the Oakland Riders case. In the Oakland Riders case, I represented, me and my co-counsel represented 120 African American males, who, all of whom were accused of various sorts of crimes. And um, we were able to determine, uh, based upon a, law, a police officer who got involved and, and, and came forward, that in point of fact that the police had been, had been committing perjuries, they had been planting dope on people, they had been lying about what happened, they were beating people up, trying to get confessions for things they had not committed. And, and, and so we were able uh, to demonstrate this and, but, and, and ultimately reach a, a huge settlement in the case. But the most important thing is that we were able to use that particular case to try and reform various aspects of the police department. And, and in, a, in a civil case, you have uh, you can have both the individual liability for the uh, for the officers and the damages related for the individuals, but you can also have what they call a Manel 
portion of the case. And the Monell portion is that there is a policy and practice of deliberate indifference or a policy and practice of constitutional violations. And, and the remedy for that is not damages for the individuals, but it's a series of reforms. Uh, and, and so we were able to do that uh, in that particular case. And, and we did it in such a way that we had uh, a federal judge that maintained, but we had an independent monitor that, that stayed involved in the case. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the case is still going on. But it also illustrates the real challenges that are presented when you're trying to address yourself to some of the major issues um, uh, in dealing with uh, police departments. I had a case um, that, I've been mo uh, that I'm involved in more presently. It's a public strip searching case where the Oakland Police Department was, in fact, when they would stop someone, African American male particularly, if they suspected that they had drugs on them, if they were on probation or parole, they would have them to drop their pants. I mean, phys physically and literally pull their pants down, look inside of their, their shorts, play with their genitals, play with their buttocks. Uh, outrageous conduct from my point of view. I mean, I'm still upset about it when I talk about it. But we were able to sue, I represented. We represent 40 people in that case, and we ultimately got the practice deemed to be unconstitutional, uh, and, and that uh, we haven't had any more cases like that since. Uh, we're still working through um, some of those, um, but it, it, it's an illustration of what, what you can do. Uh, we found out in the course of a, a practice that um, a police, with police officers, when they took, had an informant, they claimed that dope was in a certain place, they'd go get the dope, and then they would and, and then they would uh, ask the court to issue a search warrant uh, so they can go and search the person's house. But they would do it, do so, without first finding out whether the so-called dope that they'd taken, they had found was really dope. And in some occasions, it was not. And so uh, we represented maybe close to 100 people in that case. And, and, and what we were able to get in place, aside from the money that we were able to get for the people, what we were able to had the department rewrite the search warrant policy to write a policy that um, took care of and identifying and locating informants because it's always an issue, do you really have an informant or not? Um, there's a case that I'm working on out here, uh, and some of you know about these cops that um, uh, the, uh, the um, I guess it's the Contra Costa Cal, Cal, CalNet group that um, was involved um, uh, in doing, uh, uh, a couple of guys have been prosecuted uh, for having committed, um, stealing some of the drugs and then hiring prostitutes and things of that nature. Well, I'm involved in one of the cases where a young, a young man out here was shot and killed by one of those officers uh, at a time under very, very questionable circumstances. And it was in raised in our mind by whether or not they were trying to rob this guy and take his dope, but it turns out it was the wrong house. And he wasn't the dope that they thought he was. But in any event, he was killed.